Check out FlipSideGaming.com for all your gaming needs. Use the promo code HEROES to save 10% on all orders over $10. Hey there, this is John from Heroes and Legends, and welcome to another day of Throne of Eldraine previews. We're going to recap and analyze all the cards that were revealed over the last 24 hours or so. If you're curious as to the sources of any of these cards, just check out the description below. You're going to find all the information down there. And if you want to pre-order a box of Throne of Eldraine, go over to FlipSideGaming.com. Remember to use that Heroes promo code. You can save a little cash while you support the channel. It's always appreciated. But without any further ado, let's get into today's cards. We're going to start off by going back and looking at a few cards from the last couple days, but we're going to look at variations of them that we have not yet seen. So we talked about these cards in the last two videos, so if you want to hear my full thoughts on them, just go back into the playlist and check those out. But when it comes to just the aesthetics, Charming Prince, yesterday we saw the extended art copy, here's the regular. Then we have three cards that previously we saw the regular copy and not the extended art copy. That's Worthy Knight, Emery Lurker of the Lock, and Clackbridge Troll. Curious Pair, here's our first look at the showcase version of that card. The Royal Scions, here is the borderless version. And two more extended art cards here with Lockmere Serpent and Outlaw's Merriment. Beloved Princess. Okay, this is kind of a sweet card. Now, on its surface, it's not amazing, even for Drafter Sealed, right? One casting cost, one one lifelink. It has an extra ability, though. Can't be blocked by creatures of power three or greater. So it does have to be blocked by a smaller creature, but most of the time in Drafter Sealed, that won't be a problem for your opponent. Maybe early on you get a little bit of a life swing from this, but nothing crazy. With that being said, though, there are a lot of cards that could play well with this. We have seen things recently like Love Struck Beast, which can attack without a 1-1 creature on the battlefield on your side. Also, in a few minutes, we're going to look at a Mythic Rare, which if you actually are lucky enough to get that card in Limited, it does reward you for playing smaller creatures. Or you could get some equipment, get some auras, and if this thing gets buffed up, and it can only be blocked by small creatures, you could be having a good day, especially with that lifelink. This isn't something I'd play in a vacuum, but if I have good synergies with it, which I feel like should be relatively abundant in the format, then yeah, this could be a very good common. Could this see any standard play? It's going to be tough for a card like this, honestly, but whenever I see these 1-1s, one I can't help but think Cavalcade of Calamity, right? Now, I don't think this would necessarily fit as well as, say, a haste creature in a deck like that. But just keep an open mind as we look at more of these small creatures throughout the week. Beyond that, I suppose it is possible that this set may give us enough synergies with small creatures to actually have some kind of build. We're not quite there yet, though. Harmonious Archon. This is the mythic I was alluding to. On the left is the regular copy. On the right is the extended art copy. Let's talk limited first. This thing is insane. You're not going to see it a lot being a mythic, but if you can play with this, go for it. We've already been looking at a lot of small creatures in this set over the last few days. A lot of ways to make small tokens. Put it together with this card, and you got something really good going on. Six casting costs, four, five flyer. Non Archon creatures have base power, toughness, three, three. When this enters the battlefield, create two, one, one white human creature tokens. While this is in play, those one ones are actually three threes. So, yes, do the math. You're getting 10, 11 power toughness for six mana. That's unheard of. And if you have other small creatures, like the beloved princess, for example, this also plays very well with Charmed Prince, which we saw yesterday. Then you could be adding more power toughness to the battlefield when this enters as well. Now granted, if you have larger creatures, they are getting scaled down. And the same goes for your opponent. Their larger creatures scale down, their smaller creatures could scale up. Ultimately though, if you pull this off, this is going to be a force just on its own, giving you a lot of power and toughness out of nowhere. Some of it with evasion here, because this is flying. Okay, so we know this is going to be incredible for you in Limited. What about Standard? Could it get there? I'm a little skeptical. Here's why. Yes, maybe you could build a deck around this and a lot of small creatures. Obviously, like I've been saying, this set has been providing a lot of tools for that. The problem is instant removal would really blow you out. So if I attack in with this and a whole bunch of my buff creatures and this thing gets blown up, I could be having a bad day, right? I don't know how consistent that type of deck would be, but I think it's worth brewing, worth thinking about. There could be ways to make it more consistent. The other thing to consider with this when it comes to standard is let's say you did have a deck that was successful running this and a lot of small creatures. Could you imagine those mirror matches? Probably a lot of board sweeps. Righteousness. Okay, this one is a reprint. On the left side, you see the copy from Magic 2010. On the right side, you see the new copy, which was a Portuguese language preview. It's got some new art. And this is actually one of the original cards from Alpha Beta Unlimited. 
Now, in Drafter Sealed, it's okay. Like, it might not always make your cut, but it's an alright defensive combat trick. Remember, it is only defensive. You can't put this on an attacking creature. But if your opponent attacks in, they think they have you, and you have one white mana up, you might be able to turn the tables on them. Won't always make your cut, perhaps, but I do think it's worth running a percentage of the time, especially if you have a lot of small creatures, and that does appear to be one of the things you're doing in white here. Trapped in the Tower. Okay, I don't have a lot to say about this one. This is kind of a different take on the pacifism style effect. This time you can only enchant a creature without flying, but the enchanted creature can attack or block and its activated abilities can't be activated. This will be really good against a big ground creature or a creature on the ground that has a really strong activated ability that you need to cancel out. This is a common. It's very cheap. You're going to like playing this a lot when it comes to draft and sealed. True Love's Kiss. Aww. So this one is a cantrip, and it does exile target artifact or enchantment for 2 white and 2 at instant speed. It's a common. The big question for me is, is this a sideboard card or is this a main deck card? We haven't seen the whole set yet, but there does appear to be at least a fair amount of artifacts and enchantments that could matter that we have seen so far. If the environment really promotes those types of strategies, then maybe it's not wrong to main deck one of these. But maybe more likely, this is something in your sideboard that you bring in when you need it. Gadwick the Wizened. All right, I'll tell you right now, this is a legendary creature human wizard that is going to be incredible in Commander. Whether you want to build around this as your commander or just place it in a deck, you're going to be happy with this card. Clearly a great Brawl card, too. Three blue and X. It's a 3-3. Three, three. When this enters the battlefield, draw X cards. Whenever you cast a blue spell, tap target non-land permanent and opponent controls. I would be happy without the X. If this was like a three blue spell, 3-3 three, three, human wizard, and it had that tap ability, that's pretty good. But I can also pour mana into it to draw cards when I play it? What? Okay. So, first off, what can you do with this thing? Bounce it. Play it a whole bunch of times. See more cards. Nothing wrong with that. Secondly, this is a wizard, so it will play well in wizard strategies. You can play this with things like Naban Dean of Iteration, for example. And don't forget that second ability, because that's incredible, too. The more blue spells that you cast, the more things you can tap down. It leaves a path open for you to get damage across. This card is awesome. I could see it showing up in a lot of different commander builds. What about limited, though? Yeah, it's really good as long as you're comfortable with the three blue and the casting cost, right? Now, look at it this way. Even if I'm not playing a mono blue deck, which you may very well not be playing in Drafter Sealed, let's say I'm playing a 50% blue, 50% white deck. I play this mid-game. I draw some cards off of it. Over the rest of the game, I tap a few things down here or there. Definitely worth your time and what you put into it. Card will be phenomenal for you there too. But if you're not comfortable with the three blue and the casting cost in your build, then you will need to skip it. Standard, I don't know, maybe eventually a control deck could make it work. You kind of want to be mono blue, I think, or mostly blue. And that might not be realistic right now. But I do think when the Theros set comes out, there's going to be more of a focus on color devotion. And if that's the case, then of course, maybe playing a mono blue deck becomes a little bit easier. Definitely something to keep an eye on for the future. Into the story, this is fantastic instant speed removal. Now, it looks expensive at first, 2 blue and 5. However, this spell costs 3 less to cast if an opponent has 7 or more cards in their graveyard. And you're drawing 4 cards off this thing. That is significant. Let's talk about limited first. This is a great card if you're in blue. You know, if you get to the point where your opponent has 7 things in their graveyard, which is very likely in most games of Drafter Seals, wonderful. 5 casting costs instant, giving you 4 cards, just restocking your hand. And if that doesn't happen for some reason, it's not out of the question that you're going to get to the point where you can just hard cast this in a game or draft your sealed a lot of the time. Definitely don't be afraid to run one of these. When it comes to standard, I think it does see standard play. Now, maybe you could try to back this up with a little mill, but I don't think you need to in standard. Again, just play standard. Eventually, your opponent is going to get to the point where there's stuff in their graveyard. I think we will see this in control decks in the future. I would also go as far to say that this is not only going to be a good Brawl draw card, but also a good Commander draw card. Hey, Op's back again. Actually, Op never left. This is already legal and standard, and it's going to be sticking around now. Did get some new art, as you can see here. And I don't have a lot to say about this card. You know what it does. It's good and limited. It's good and standard. It's good and modern. Here's a German language preview stolen by the Fey. This is a rare, so again, another card you're not going to see a ton of in Drafter Sealed but definitely worth your time if you have the opportunity to play with it. So the jury is out right now if there's going to be like a good fairy draft deck. Time will tell over the next couple weeks, but 
even if fairies are just a thing that are kind of sprinkled in here or there and they're not actually a true archetype, then this is still a good card. It doesn't matter if you don't have a good way to buff them or something like that. Having a bunch of small flyers is very, very good. Remember Lingering Souls. So look at it this way. In a perfect world, you can bounce one of your opponent's creatures, maybe in the middle to later portion of the game, tempo them, get a whole bunch of flyers, close out the game. Or you could even bounce one of your own things if you needed to. Maybe you just had the better target, the larger creature, for example. Or perhaps you want to bring a creature back to your hand because it has a good entrance of battlefield effect and you want to recast it. Or it has an adventure attached to it. There's a lot of value doing that. I've said that earlier in the week. If you can play an adventure, play the creature, bounce the creature, and then do it again, that's pretty good. The only awkward part is you do need to bounce a creature. You can't just pay to create fairies. What that means to me mostly, though, is it does make the card a little bit awkward for standard, unfortunately, because you need kind of a specific board state, and you need the mana to pump into it at the right time. It is not an instant, it is sorcery speed, so it might feel a little clunky sometimes. With that being said, though, some part of me, even though I know Lingering Souls is a much better card, much more efficient card, some part of me is thinking there are some parallels to this in Lingering Souls. You're paying more, definitely, to get these flyers, and you do have to have a certain board state, but if you can get yourself a few flyers, sometimes it's just super annoying for your opponent to get past. Probably wishful thinking on my part. In Brawl or Commander, if you have a fairy deck, there you go. This is going to be perfect for those. Here's a German language preview card, Sir Eleonora the Discerning. It's a legendary creature, human knight. It's not in Mardu colors, but it is a knight. My favorite part of this card is that it does replace itself. So when it enters the battlefield, you get to draw a card. So let's say this is even just like a 2-4 that replaces itself that costs you 5. That feels pretty good for me in Draft and Sealed. I'm really happy to play that. But it also does more. It does require your opponent to pay more mana if they are targeting it with a spell. That's nice. And also, the power is variable based on the number of cards in your hand. This will be best, obviously, if you can draw some cards, hang on to cards that you don't need, extra lands or whatever. And even if you do that, the toughness never goes up. So it could be blocked by a couple two twos even, and that's kind of the end of your fun. But again, because you're getting the card out of the transaction, I think it's going to be good for you. Standard, I'm not really feeling this one at that casting cost, especially considering it's an off-color knight. Ayara, first of Locked Wayne. Okay, so this is another card that feels like it's pushing a little bit towards monocolor devotion with three black in the casting cost. It's a 2-3 legendary creature elf noble. Interesting that it's an elf. So basically, if this or any other black creature enters the battlefield under your control, each opponent loses one life and you gain one life. It is each opponent for multiplayer games. That's nice. And you can tap, sacrifice another black creature, and draw a card. So that's always good. Limited, again, you do have that awkwardness. Three on color. If your deck can handle it, wonderful. Go for it. If your deck might have trouble getting this out in a timely manner, then you do want to skip it. But if you do play this, the good news is, as the game goes on, if you have some small black creatures that become obsolete, then you can go ahead and sacrifice them, tap this, draw a card. Always nice to be able to go deeper into your deck. And then also during the course of the game, that life swing might not be inconsequential. Again, even if you're not in a mono black deck, which you probably won't be in Drafter Sealed, maybe your deck's 50% black, 50% another color, then yeah, there's enough value. Even if that triggers four or five times over the course of the game, that's great. Could this be standard play? Maybe in Mardu Aristocrats, perhaps. I do feel like it really wants to be in a mono black deck. And again, much like the card we saw a little while ago, this might get even better when Theros comes out as long as there is a devotion theme, and it feels like that's the direction we're going into. Bognaughty. Okay, this is a little expensive, definitely a limited card, but it's a 3-3 flyer and it has an ability that works with food. For black and two, sack of food, target creature gets minus three, minus three until end of turn, and that does not tap, which means I could do that as soon as it comes into play if I have enough mana, or I could do it more than one time per turn. That could be very strong in Draft and Sealed as long as I have enough food to back it up. And also, it isn't uncommon, so these will be floating around, at least to some degree, in a draft. It is also a fairy, which is worth noting. Like I've been saying, I haven't seen the big payoff yet for playing a lot of fairies in Draft or Sealed, but maybe something will come along. Cauldron Familiar. Okay, this is an interesting one drop. It also drains a little bit of life, kind of like the card we saw a few moments ago. So this would play good in conjunction with that. But maybe there's also some other cards we haven't seen yet that do similar things. Put a bunch of them together with a food strategy and maybe you have something there. The other portion of this card, of course, is all about food. Sacrifice a food and this goes from the graveyard directly to the battlefield. In Limited, this is only really good if you feel like your deck is going to consistently be able to bring it back from the graveyard. 
If you feel comfortable in the strength of your food in your deck, then go for it because this does add up over time and actually could make an impact. Now, what about Standard or Brawl? Can we break this card and create an endless loop? I should probably say a reasonable loop. There might be a way to do it, but keep your eyes peeled as more cards come out from this set and future sets. Wouldn't it shock me if a loop eventually showed up? When you're talking Commander, there are probably ways to do it there with all the cards you have access to. It is cool that the damage actually hits each opponent. Epic Downfall. This is actually really sweet. It is sorcery speed, but check this out. Black and one exile target creature with converted mana cost three or greater. It does exile the creature. And also, you're only paying two for this, even if it is sorcery speed. And it's hitting things, by definition, that are going to cost more than two. So the economy is perfect here. Limited, first pickable draft on common. This is going to be premium removal for you. And it's very splashable. This is not going to last very long going around the draft table. And if you're lucky enough to get one, maybe even two of these in your seal pool, you're having a good day. This will definitely see standard play out of sideboards. Sometimes maybe the main deck, depending on where the meta is. Remember, next spring we're going to the land of the behemoths. Reeve Soul. This one is a reprint. It did get some new art, and this card actually does see pauper play. Now, when it comes to the limited, yeah, we have another piece of premium removal here. Very high pick common for sure. Little different from the previous card. Not quite as powerful, but still very, very good. Black and one sorcery, destroy target creature of power three or less. This could see standard play out of sideboards, and in some metas, maybe could creep into a few main decks here or there. Fervent Champion. This card is a super pushed rare. This is actually Javier Dominguez's World Championship card, and that's his likeness on it. He actually was the one that previewed it as well. So, let's talk limited first with this thing. Just cost one. It's a 1-1 one, one first strike haste. Whenever this attacks another target attacking knight you control, gets plus one plus zero oh until end of turn. Equip abilities you activate that target this costs three less to activate. In Draft Your Sealed on its own, it's an aggressive card, great way to start off a game. It can get some damage in early on, that first strike will give it more endurance. And ultimately, as the game progresses, you just want to throw some equipment on it and keep the ball rolling. It's a knight, so it fits into knight strategies. It's a 1 1 creature, which also fits into these strategies we've been seeing that care about 1 1 creatures from time to time. This is one of the best rares that we've seen, and not just for limited either. Let's talk some standard with this card. This is going to see standard play day one, I have no doubt. Sure, you could try to build some sort of aggressive knight deck with the cards from this set, but I don't even think you need to think hard about this one. Throw this into a variation of the mono red aggro deck. Play this in multiples with Cavalcade of Calamity. The deck just kind of builds itself, right? This is going to be something you'll see a lot of, especially early on in this next meta. I would also go as far as to say this has modern potential in an aggressive deck, and also remember Stoneforge Mystic is now unbanned there. Opportunistic Dragon. Okay, more good top-down design here. Now, this card's a little easier to cast than a lot of the cards we've seen today, only asking two red and two here. And it is a rare again, so much like a lot of the other cards we saw today. Not going to show up a lot in Drafter Sealed. But when you do get a chance to play with it, you're going to be pretty happy. A 4-3 flyer for 2 red and 2, those are pretty good stats. You don't see that all the time to begin with. And you know what? That could be good enough on its own, but it does more. When it enters the battlefield, you get to choose target human or artifact and opponent controls. For as long as this remains on the battlefield, you gain control of that permanent. But here's the catch. It loses all abilities, and if it is a creature, it can't attack or block. So it doesn't really do anything for you, but you're just kind of hanging on to it so your opponent can't use it either. And you know what? The extra ability attached to the power toughness and the casting cost here? That's a wonderful economy. Standard. I think the economy is good in that format as well. And if there's powerful humans or artifacts that emerge in any metas in the future, this will be a very fine answer to them. Especially if there's a good, consistent sack outlet that you might be able to get. So whether it's the main deck or sideboard, I do think this card will see some play in standard in some capacity. Scorching Dragonfire. This is a great common for Drafter Seal. The number of these will be around. I'll be happy to play them any chance that I get. Two casting cost instant speed. It's going to deal three damage to creature or planeswalker. And if that creature or planeswalker would die, exile it instead. Could this see standard play? Well, it does add flexibility being able to hit a planeswalker. And we know planeswalkers have been pretty powerful. I'm looking at you, Teferi Time Raveler. So maybe this could see a little sideboard play here or there because of the flexibility. Seven Dwarfs, more top-down design incoming. So this is a two casting cost 2-2. Two, two. You know I love my bears with upside. 
So this is interesting because a deck can have up to seven cards named Seven Dwarfs in there. And the reason you might want to do that, Seven Dwarfs gives plus one, plus one for each other creature named Seven Dwarfs you control. So if I get a second one in play, they both become three threes. If I get a third one, now they're all four fours. But I'm not going to be totally disappointed if that doesn't happen. Still a good card on its own. And still playable on its own, even if you only had a singleton. You just sometimes need cards in your two spot. This is a very serviceable card, even though in some cases it might just be basically a vanilla 2-2. One thing you do need to know, though, they did clarify this. You cannot have more than seven copies of the card, even in draft. So if you happen to draft eight of these, you can only play seven of them. So keep that in mind. Regardless, though, I don't really see this being a standard strategy or anything like that. But again, another very good card for Drafter Sealed. Insatiable Appetite. This is a combat trick for Drafter Sealed. Without food, it's a normal combat trick. Plus three, plus three. It costs a green and one. Good offensively, good defensively. Doesn't always make your cut, but definitely can be better in some builds, especially if you have creatures with trample or evasion. The food brings a little more to it, giving something plus five, plus five until end of turn. So if you can sack food when you play it, that is pretty sizable. Again, if you have food, this gets better. If you don't, it's still a decent card. Mara Leaf Rider, this is a 3-1 for 2, and those are usually decent stats in Limited. Here's what I like about those type of creatures. If your opponent stumbles at all, you could get 3, maybe 6 damage across. And more than likely, they're going to trade up a lot of the time and maybe take out a 3-drop or something like that, sometimes even a 4-drop. For that reason, I find myself playing these quite a bit, and this one kind of forces the issue if you do sacrifice a food. Target creature has to block this turn if able. So if the creature is untapped, you can kind of choose your target there. Also note that this is another off-color knight. Ginger Brute. Okay, we saw this art a long time ago. Here's the creature that goes along with it. I actually like this thing a lot, and let's talk draft and seal first with it. It's a food golem, and you can pay two, tap, sack it, gain three life, kind of like a food token. So it's going to fit into any kind of food token artifact strategies out there. And that could be pretty good on its own. But there's more to it than just that. In an aggressive build, this is a one-drop haste creature 1-1. You could get some early damage across, and it has a good option for evasion built in. Pay one, and this can't be blocked this turn except by creatures with haste. It is very possible, in fact likely, that your opponent might not have haste creatures to block this with. Throw an aura on this, throw some equipment on this, this could be very good for you. Also, it does feel like on some level that artifacts do matter within the limited environment, so just having an artifact could be good sometimes. What about standard? Could this see standard play? I'm going to say this card's name again. I guess I've been thinking a lot about it recently. Cavalcade of Calamity. Could you throw this into a mono red aggro deck with cavalcades? I mean, it's a 1-1 haste creature for one, plus it has the built-in potential evasion, and it could gain you life on the fly if you needed it. Seems like it's at least worth testing. Inquisitive Puppet. Okay, I love the top-down design on this one. This is really sweet. I guess he's going to become a real boy, but not until he blocks some creatures for you. So the first thing I would say, if you're playing Drafter Sealed and this is not in your main deck and you come up against an aggressive build, go ahead and side it in. Turn one, you might be able to play this as a 0-2 and you get to scry one. That's kind of nice. And when your opponent does come at you with something that will kill this thing, block with it, exile it, get the 1-1 human creature token, and then you have another blocker if you need to. It could slow down the game enough to get your legs under you. Also, I mentioned earlier, it could matter just to have artifacts. And as we saw earlier in the video, It could matter just to have a 1-1 white human creature token. That could actually fit into some strategies that we've been looking at all week. Because of that, this is a utility player in Limited. Might not always make your cut, just depends on what your deck's doing, but there are builds that will want this. Sorceress Spyglass gets some new art in this reprinting, and this is originally from Ixalan, so having this here means it's going to be sticking around the standard environment longer. And this is a card that has seen standard play, Beyond that, it has seen actually modern legacy and vintage play at times too. On top of that, it can be an okay sideboard card in limited, especially once you play a game and you know what the bigger threats are, you can bring it in to name one of those threats. And in this set, maybe it's a little bit better even because it's an artifact. Spinning Wheel. Okay, when it comes to Drafter Seal, this is one of the best mana rocks I've seen in a while. Three casting costs, so pretty typical for a mana rock. Like a lot of other good mana rocks, you can tap to add one mana of any color. And that's great. It can fix colors. It can ramp you, especially if you have a multicolor deck and you're trying to play something that's a little more devoted to one color. This could help you there. And beyond that, it can do something later in the game when you don't even need the mana anymore. 
See, that's the biggest drawback to playing a mana rock, that you don't draw it until like turn 10 or something and you don't need the mana. I got a rock. This is going to do something for you. You're going to be able to still use that second ability. Pay five, tap and tap target creature. That actually could be very good, not only in the middle portion of the game, but into the long game. And granted, like I said, it's not a bad thing in this set necessarily just to have an artifact sitting there. I would go as far as to say this is a mana rock that I would be interested in, not just in Brawl, but also Commander. Granted, there's a million different mana rocks in Commander, sure. But this can help clear a path and maybe push across some Commander damage. All right, those are the cards for today. Now we're going to come back tomorrow and we're going to recap everything that comes out over the next 24 hours. But until next time, hey, thanks for watching. Please remember to like and subscribe and have a great day. Hey, thanks for watching. This video is made possible through the generous support of viewers like you on Patreon. Check out the description below for links to our Patreon page as well as our Amazon affiliate store where a small percentage of all sales will also help support the channel. Finally, if you haven't had a chance yet to subscribe, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any of the new videos on Heroes and Legends. Talk to you again soon and have a great day.